page 26. Anol's key literary critical device is the notion of the touchstone, which avoids any definitions of desirable literary qualities and merely suggests using aspects of the literature of the past as a means of measuring and assessing the literature of today. The way the touchstone works is consciously explained in J. A. Cudden, C. U. D. D. O. N. apostrophe S. Cudden's Dictionary of Literary Terms and Literary Theory, 3rd edition, Blackwell, 1991, indent. A touchstone is dot 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 so called because gold is tried by it. Stop. Matthew Arnold used the word in his essay. The Study of Poetry, 1880, in connection with literary criteria and standards. Stop. Para. Arnold advises that we should, quote, have always in mind lines and expressions of the great masters and apply them as a touchstone to other poetry, unquote, stop. He suggests that his touchstone method should provide the basis for a real rather than an historic or a personal estimate of poetry. See Cudden, page 980, para. In the first half of the 20th century, the key critical names in Britain were F. R. Lewis, T. S. Eliot, William Empson, and I. A. Richards. All except Eliot were at Cambridge in the 1920s and 1930s involved in the pioneering English school there, which had a powerful influence on the teaching of English worldwide up to the 1970s. Eliot's contribution to the canon of received critical ideas was the greatest, his major critical ideas being para, one, the notion of the, quote, dissociation of sensibility, unquote, comma, developed in the course of his review article on Herbert Grierson's edition of the Metaphysical Poets, the notion of poeting impersonality, impersonality within quote, developed in the course of his two-part essay, quote, tradition and the individual talent, unquote, and the notion of the objective correlative developed in his essay on Hamlet. All these ideas have become controversial. The idea that a dissociation of sensibility occurred in the 17th century, radically separating thought from feeling, is one for which historical evidence has never been found. Later in his career, Iliad denied that he thought the dissociation had been caused by the English Civil War, though he added rather cryptically that he thought it might have been page 27, caused by the same factors as those which brought about the civil war, a nice distinction. The best use of the idea is simply as a way of describing the special qualities of mind and sensibility which we detect in the metaphysical poets. As a historical generalization, it seems quite without support. The best critic of the idea can be found in Frank Kermode's book, Romantic Image, Para. The idea of impersonality was partly Eliot's way of deflecting current thinking about poetry away from ideas of originality and self-expression which derive from Romanticism. Eliot's own personality and the education he had received in Harvard made this emphasis on the individual highly distasteful. It was much more congenial to him to see poetry not as a pouring out of personal emotion and personal experience, but as a transcending of the individual by a sense of tradition which spoke through and is transmitted by the individual poet. The best parts of a poet's work, he says, are not those which are most original, but those in which the voice of his predecessors can be most clearly heard speaking through him. Hence, there is a large distinction to be drawn between the mind of the individual experiencing human being and the voice which speaks in the poetry. This was not an original thought, 
Shelley, as we saw, had something very like it in his defense of poetry dash, but Eliot was the first to make in the cornerstone make it the cornerstone of a whole poetic aesthetic. Para. The objective correlative finally is really another encapsulation of English empiricist attitudes. It holds that the best way of expressing an emotion in art is to find some vehicle for it in gesture, action or concrete symbolism rather than approaching it directly or descriptively. This is undoubtedly true. Little is gained in fiction or poetry by having characters or narrators say what they feel. It has to be shown in some way in words or actions. This is perhaps little more than the ancient distinction first made by Plato between mimesis and digesis, M-I-M-E-S-I-S and D-I-E-G-E-S-I-S. The former is a showing of something in the character's own words or in actions which we actually see on the stage if it is a play while the latter is telling the audience or reader about things they don't see for themselves or experience in the direct speech of the characters. All Eliot's major critical ideas are thus flawed and unsatisfactory and perhaps their long-standing currency is indicative of the theoretical vacuum into which they were launched. Page 28, Para. The most influential British critic prior to the theory movement was F. R. Lewis. Lewis, like Arnold in the previous century, assumed that the study and appreciation of literature is a precondition to the health of society. He, too, distrusted abstract thought and looked for a system of literary appreciation bracket like Arnold's touchstones bracket closed which bypassed fixed criteria arguing instead for an openness to the qualities of the text. Like Arnold finally he rejected any attempt to politicize either literature or criticism directly. Para. The two differ however in a few notable regards. Arnold, uh, for example, takes the pantheon of past great writers more or less for granted. He does not question the excellence of Dante, for instance, which is why Dante can become a touchstone. By contrast, Lewis sometimes wrote essays attacking the reputations of major established figures, and indeed it was the essence of his method to argue that some reputations would not stand up to the kind of close textual scrutiny he constantly recommended. Arnold in his critical ideas had read everything. He implies, bracket, how could you, since you don't have the unlimited time of the professional critic, bracket close, but if you have read the best and can identify its qualities, then you can be confident in looking at new writing and reaching a true judgment on it. This protestant aesthetic encourages a direct relationship between the individual reader and the literary greats. Para. F. R. Lewis began as an admirer of Eliot's critical work as well as of his poetry but later greatly modified his views. He avoided the coining of critical vocabulary and instead used a as critical terms, words and phrases which already had established lay senses. Life, for instance, is used by Lewis almost as a critical term, as is the notion of felt experience. For Lewis, the crucial test is whether the work is conducive to life and vitality. Lewis's extreme popularity was partly due to the fact that he was essentially a kind of combined avatar of Johnson and Arnold, offering again the former's moralism and the latter's social vision and anti-theoretical critical practice. Lewis is still so pervasive an influence that little more need be said about him here. Para. William Empson and I. A. Richards can perhaps be taken as a pair, though the latter was the tutor of the former in the late 1920s.
Emson's book, Seven Types of Ambiguity, 1930, was itself somewhat ambiguous in its effects, page 29. On the one hand, its ultra-close readings of text demonstrated the kind of text-led extreme which might be seen as the logical development of the track one tradition of British criticism described above. The word ambiguity in the book's title can be translated as verbal difficulty and Empson unravels his examples by meticulous textual surgery rather than references out to a wider context. On the other hand, though, Empson's basic attitude towards language is that it is really a very slippery medium indeed. When we handle language, we need to be aware that the whole thing is likely to explode into meanings we hadn't suspected of being there at all. As we go from ambiguity type 1 to type 7, we seem to be approaching the frontiers of language where the territory eventually becomes unmappable, comma, and we seem to end up looking into a void of linguistic indeterminacy. This can be seen as an anticipation from within the British tradition of post-structuralist views about the unreliability of language as a medium. See page 62. But the placing of language within any context naturally tends to reduce or eliminate ambiguity. For instance, the word pain, when you hear it spoken in isolation, is ambiguous since it sounds the same as P-A-N-E, pen, but encounter it in the context of any actual situation of usage and the ambiguity disappears. Hence, the later Empson drew back from the linguistic void by stressing, in particular, the autobiographical context in which literary works, in his view, are grounded. Para I. A. Richards finally is the pioneer of the decontextualized approach to literature, which became the norm in Britain from the 1930s to the 1970s as practical criticism and in America during roughly the same period as the new criticism. Richard's experiments in the 1920s of presenting students and tutors with unannotated anonymous poems for commentary and analysis give, gave rise to the ideal of removing the props of received opinion and knowledge and fostering a true judgment based on first-hand opinion. It is easy to see the connection between this and Arnold's touchstones. What is certain is that this decisive Ricardian, R-I-C-A-R-D-I-A-N moment established the track one practical tradition of criticism so completely for so long that a selective amnesia descended on the discipline and it came to be widely regarded as the only tradition that had ever existed. Para. The subsequent conflict between liberal humanism and theory is a pretty fundamental one, but it is worth reminding ourselves that, page 30, it is actually much older than the 1970s when it broke out with such force in Britain, America and elsewhere. Similar debates and arguments took place in the 1930s, for instance, between F. R. Lewis, whom we might regard as the archetypal British liberal humanist and the critical theorist René Velleck. Lewis and Velleck debated the relationship between literary criticism and philosophy in the pages of Lewis's journal Scrutiny. Wellick's point against Lewis was simply that practical criticism was not enough. He ought to spell out the theoretical assumptions on which his readings and his procedures generally were based. In Wellick's view, a series of close readings of romantic poets in Lewis's book Revaluations is offered to the reader in a theoretical vacuum. As he politely put it, quote, I could wish that you had stated your assumptions more explicitly and defended them systematically. Scrutiny, March 1937, page 376.
this refusal to accept the liberal humanist method as simply the natural and taken for granted way of doing literature is the crux of theory's general response to it. Though less politely than Wellek, theorists make the same demand as he did. Spell out what you do and why when you read and criticize literature so that your methods can be evaluated along with others. Implicit in this demand is the view that if these things are made explicit as we try to do in the previous section, then the weaknesses of liberal humanist assumptions and procedures will become apparent and other approaches will have a chance of replacing them. Para, the work of all the figures discussed in this section can be found in the collections English Critical Texts, edited by D. J. Enright, E. N. R. I. G. H. T. Enright, and Ernst, E. R. N. S. T. D. D. E. Chikera, C. H. I. C. K. E. R. A. Oxford University Press, 1962. Section Liberal Humanism in Practice, Para. It is perhaps unnecessary to supply a full-scale example of liberal humanist practice since that practice will surely be familiar to anyone reading this book. However, I'll sketch out mainly for comparative purposes what I would consider to be a characteristic liberal humanist reading of Edgar Allan Poe's Tell the Oval Portrait, see Appendix 1, since the tell will be used later to illustrate structuralism in practice and narratology. Page 31, para. A liberal humanist approach to this tale, bracket, or to be more specific, a Levisite approach, bracket closed, might focus on the evident conflict of values in the story between art and life. The central point of commentary and interpretation might be the moralist argument that true value lies in the lived life of the unique individual and that it is disastrous for the artist to fail to recognize the necessary subservience of art to a communal reality. Further, when artists begin to see themselves as Faustian, F-A-U-S-T-I-A-N, superheroes, able to cross all boundaries of taste, taboo and conduct and even to assume the godlike role of creating and sacrificing life itself, then a hubristic, H-U-B-R-I-S-T-I-C act is committed which ultimately dries up the sources of the life of art itself. Hence, the artist in this tale in his isolated turret feeding vampire-like on the vital and energies of his sitter is an emblem of a debased and degenerate form of art whose values are of the purely aesthetic art for art's sake kind and have no reference to any wider notion of personal and psychic health. Para. Two things stand out in this approach. Firstly, this kind of reading is driven ultimately by its moral convictions laudable in themselves, of course, rather than by any model of what constitutes a systematic approach to literary criticism. The robust championing of life in the above sketch makes the term Levisite, L-E-A-V-I-S-I-T-E, Levisite within quote, seem an appropriate one to apply to it. The second notable aspect of it is that it seems to be to bypass matters of form, structure, genre, and so on, and launches straight into the discussion of matters of content. If the sketch were filled out, there would doubtless be comments on such characteristics as structure, symbol, and design, but they would probably be secondary in nature, intended as concrete support for the primary focus of the reading, which is the moral position taken. I am not, of course, dismissing such an approach as worthless. My intention is simply to characterize it and distinguish it from other approaches. Section, the transition to theory, theory within quote, para. The growth of critical theory in the post-war period seems to comprise a series of waves, waves within quote, 
each associated with a specific decade and all aimed against the liberal humanist consensus just illustrated, page 32, which had been established between the 1930s and the 1950s. In the 1960s, firstly, there were two older but still unassimilated rival new approaches, these being Marxist criticism, which had been pioneered in the 1930s and then reborn in the 1960s, and psychoanalytic criticism, which was of the same vintage and was similarly renewing itself in the 1960s. At the same time, two new approaches were mounting vigorous direct assaults on liberal humanist orthodoxies, namely uh, linguistic criticism, which came into being in the early 1960s, and early forms of feminist criticism, which started to become a significant factor at the end of the decade. Para. Then, in the 1970s, news spread in literary critical circles in Britain and the United States of controversial new critical approaches, in particular structuralism and post-structuralism, both of which originated in France. The effect of these two was so powerful as to produce by the late 1970s and early 1980s a situation which was frequently referred to as a crisis or civil war in the discipline of English. The questions these two approaches centered upon concern matters of language and philosophy rather than history or context. In the 1980s, a shift occurred which is sometimes called the turn to history whereby history, politics and context were reinstated at the center of the literary critical agenda. Thus, in the early 1980s, two new forms of political stroke historical criticism emerged, new historicism from the United States and cultural materialism from Britain. Both these take what might be called a holistic approach to literature, aiming to integrate literary and historical study while at the same time maintaining some of the insights uh, of the structuralists and post-structuralists of the previous decade. Para. Finally, in the 1990s, a general flight from overarching grand explanations seemed to be taking place and there was what seemed a decisive drift towards dispersal, eclecticism and special interest forms of criticism and theory. Thus, the approach known as post-colonialism rejects the idea of a universally applicable Marxist explanation of things and emphasizes the separateness or otherness of post-imperial nations and people. Likewise, postmodernism stresses the uniquely fragmented nature of much contemporary experience. Feminism too shows signs of dissolving into a loose federation known as gender studies with gay and lesbian texts emerging as distinct fields of literature and hence implying and generating appropriate, page 33, and distinct critical approaches. Also part of this 1990s federation is black feminist or womanist criticism. The necessary limits on a book like the present one make it impossible to include everything, and for the time being it does not venture beyond the early post-millennial developments outlined in chapter 15. Section Some Recurrent Ideas in Critical History Para These different approaches each have their separate traditions and histories, but several ideas are recurrent in critical theory and seem to form what might be regarded as its common bedrock. Hence it makes some sense to speak to speak of quote theory unquote as if it were a single entity with a set of underlying beliefs as long as we are aware that doing so is a simplification. Some of these recurrent underlying ideas of theory are listed below. 1. Many of the notions which we would usually regard as the basic givens G -I -V -E -N -S within quote, of our existence, bracket, including our gender identity, our individual selfhood and the notion of literature itself, bracket closed, 
are actually fluid and unstable things rather than fixed and reliable essences. Instead of being solidly there in the real world of fact and experience, they are socially constructed that is dependent on social and political forces and on shifting ways of seeing and thinking. In philosophical terms, all these are contingent categories, bracket, denoting a status which is temporary, provisional, circumstance dependent, bracket closed, rather than absolute ones, that is fixed, immutable, etc. Hence, no overarching fixed truths can ever be established. The results of all forms of intellectual inquiry are provisional only. There is no such thing as a fixed and reliable truth bracket, except for the statement that this is so, presumably, bracket close, top. The position on these matters which theory attacks is often referred to in a kind of shorthand as essentialism, while many of the theories discussed in this book would describe themselves as anti-essentialist. Para number two. Theorists generally believe that all thinking and investigation is necessarily affected and largely determined by prior ideological commitment. The notion of disinterested inquiry is therefore untenable. None of us, they would agree, is capable of standing back 